Hey, my friends, I had the opportunity, uh, I guess it's been a few years now, to talk to Trey Crowder, a liberal redneck. And uh, I had told him on several occasions, I got to get you back on the show. Finally, I have the opportunity to do so. Trey, good to see you, man. Hey, Seth, good to see you too. Your star has risen since the last time we spoke. I think it was 2016. And holy shit, man. Uh, Can you sort of paint the picture of how your world has changed in the last... 36 months um well given that it was 2016 i mean uh do you remember what like month of 2006 or like it was, season it was was right, it before the election it was before the election and it was um you had done the in fact the reason you were on my radar was the transgender bathrooms thing yeah you know right like, okay, what so bathrooms was, you think they've been using was the line i remember and it was right then that I, you appeared on my radar so that's about the time yeah. you were introduced what's up y'all live a redneck here we gonna do it again fired up son I've been seeing all these Facebook posts about transgender bathrooms, and every one of them comes down to the same shit. Well, hell, what's to stop some pervert from wrapping a skirt around his wiener and going in the ladies' room with my baby girl? I ain't having that. We gotta watch out for the kids, the kids, the kids. Meanwhile, these are the same motherfuckers that put Mountain Dew in sippy cups and beat a six-year-old with a wire hanger for standing in front of the TV during Dr. Oz. Y'all are so full of shit. What do you think is gonna happen? You do know that transgender people have existed forever, right? What bathrooms do you think they've been using? And how many times do you ever hear about what you're worried about happening, happening? Hardly not, never. Because even people that are child molesters are not going to prey on a kid in broad daylight, in public, especially not with their mouth-breathing troglodyte daddy 12 feet outside the door just dying to punch something different. It don't make no sense. And what about little boys? The vast majority of people that prey on little boys are adult males. This law don't affect them one way or the other. So unless you're also suggesting that we have separate bathrooms for Catholic priests, I think you need to cut the shit. Quit being a pussy and say what you mean. You're freaked out. The thought of a man wanting to be a woman disgusts you. Because like most things that disgust you, you lack the capacity to understand it. You know, homos, algebra, shit like that. And y'all ain't gonna change. I realize that now, but that's okay, because the rest of us are trying to ensure that the next generation, you know, your kids, grow up in a world that's a little more open-minded, and that's happening whether you like it or not. Bye. Been on a tour ever since, all over the country, with uh, two other like-minded Southern comedian buddies of mine, Corey Forrester and Drew Morgan. The three of us wrote a, a book together in that time frame. I've been on, you know, Bill Maher show a couple times, The View and Nightline, and uh, you know, MSNBC, and CNN shit. a few times. That type of that type of stuff, and uh, have all. And then, but big personal life change. I moved to uh, to Los Angeles with my family in January 2017. I've been out here uh, trying to get tv shows made uh ever since while still touring and doing stand-up and you know putting out videos and all that um but yeah it's been pretty wild nightline right bill maher how i mean your phone rings and, and you get off the phone do you have that conversation you're like how did i get here like i do this from time to time in my own very small way how did i get here how'd this happen like you're doing stand-ups you're doing a cell phone video you're just doing this thing doing what you do and all of a sudden, lightning strikes. Do you have those thoughts? De- definitely. Sometimes. Um, I, I mean, it, no, it's very surreal because it's like, you know, I don't feel any different in terms of, like, as a person or anything like that. And, like, uh, you know, I've got I've got two young sons, married, all that. And all that is, like, obviously things have changed for all of us, but, like, uh, on just like a moment to moment basis, things don't really feel that different. But then there are times, obviously, where, you know, things are insanely different and crazy and <laughs> yeah. surreal. And it's all sort of like blurred together. And yeah, it's very, uh, it can be very weird, uh, but, you know, in a good way. Uh, now, where'd you move? Uh, of the time. Where'd you move to LA from again? Remind me, it was Tennessee. Knoxville, yeah. Knoxville, Tennessee, yeah. Well, uh, a, outside of Knoxville, technically, but yeah. There's a culture shift. 
right? It definitely is, but from doing stand up and wanting to do stand up, like I had taken multiple trips to LA already by the time I moved here, uh, because of comedy and whatnot. And also I had like a- actively wanted to move out here for, for for the same reasons, like just because of wanting to get into like the comedy industry, uh, you know, that you need to be in LA or New York. But for me, it was LA for that. So like I was pretty prepared for that, you know, culture shift. Like I I knew what I was getting into. I mean, it is very different, but you know, I was ready for, for it for the most part. I don't know how else to ask this. I'll just ask it. I mean, liberal redneck is not an act. I mean, you are straight. I mean, you, you own it. Yeah. I'm a straight up good old boy. I'm a country boy. From Tennessee, it's not like, you know, when the mic's off and the camera's off, you're like, you know, you've got this sort of, uh, you know, I don't know, you don't sound like you came out of Berkeley. You just sound uh-huh. like a dude, you know, you're just that dude. I mean, this is really you, right? Yeah, the way I normally uh, describe it, uh, because I think it's, you know, an accurate way to describe it, is that uh, the liberal redneck is a character in that it's just me like cranked way up to 11 <laughs> you know hey the internet it's me trey back on the porch i know it's been a minute but damn i just been busier than donald trump at a fuck shit up conference so i apologize but i wanted to come out here because a lot of people have asked me what i think about black lives matter well put simply i think that they do god damn and further i think that responding to that sentiment with all lives matter would be sort of like telling susan g coleman to chill it with all the pink shit on account of all cancer sucks that last part's true, but it ain't really the fucking point. But a lot of other people have talked about those things a lot better than I can. I want to do what I do and address my people for a minute. Because, see, this has been framed largely as being Black Lives Matter versus the police. And from what I've seen, rednecks have pretty unanimously been against Black Lives Matter, which is pretty funny to me. Rednecks, help me out here. When did we start liking cops? I must have missed the memo on that and boys. Yeah, for those of you who don't know, rednecks and the police are natural enemies and pretty much always have been. You ever seen the show, Cops? About every other episode takes place in the damn trailer park. And if that ain't enough for you, the single most popular redneck TV show of all time is literally just about two cousin fucking good old boys running from the law in a sweet ass orange car. You ever see Smokey and the Bandit? The hero ain't fucking Smokey. It's sort of a whole thing with us. I've been surrounded by rednecks my whole life. I have never once seen them react positively to a sudden police presence. Though, to be fair, it's sort of hard to stay positive when you think your midget mud wrestling tournament's about to get shut down. Dirty little titty, skew! See, that's the thing. Cops do fuck rednecks. Always have, probably always will. But we're usually up to some pretty redneck shit. Goddamn, man, what's this country coming to? When a man can't even put a stick of dynamite inside a washing machine with Obama's face painted on the side of it without some pussy calling the law. See, cops and rednecks have a strained relationship because cops typically stand in the way of our shenanigans. But imagine for a second that instead of busting us for trying to sell our food stamps for weed money, they were busting our heads open for resisting arrest. One of our favorite pastimes, by the way. Or they were murdering rednecks in front of kids because we had a gun in the truck which we always do. What would we say then? What would the NRA say then? Because rednecks love guns, and if you ask them why, one of the most common answers would be because they need them in the event of oppression from a tyrannical government. But when a group of people who deals with that kind of oppression on a day-to-day basis carries firearms and pays with their lives for it, we're nowhere to be found. Not advocating violence against police officers, the assholes who did that are deeply disturbed outliers who don't represent the movement. My point is, I would have hoped that rednecks of all people could have empathized with this whole thing. But we don't. And I wonder why. Just kidding. I don't wonder. Nobody does. Because everybody knows the reason. And that's sort of the whole problem. Everything about it is authentic, comes from an authentic place. But, I mean, yes, it's very embellished and exaggerated uh, for, you know, just comedic effect. I tell people sometimes, you know, like, 
because every now and then, either on the internet or whatever, I'll run into people who think that I'm like exactly like that, like all the time. But I mean, if I, you know, went around living my day to day life, acting the way I act in those videos, I'd be pretty hard to be around, you know, I'd be pretty obnoxious. <laughs> so it is all, it's very genuine, uh, but you know, it's still not exactly just me, you know. Take a lot of heat from uh, people. I mean, I'm from Oklahoma. I mean, I like to make right. fun of rednecks because I are one. Uh, you, uh -huh. know, we, you know, we all, we can all get our redneck on around here. But there are some people who, right. you know, if you talk about a certain demographic of people and you talk about the rednecks, how come you're always dogging on the South? How come you're always dogging on the Southwest or the Midwest or whatever? Do you ever get that? Some people give you some pushback? Not that. I mean, you know, here and there, anytime you operate on the Internet, you're going to get all kinds of different uh you know, fun and inventive hate <laughs> spewed at you. They really innovate in the hate world on the internet. But, um, but for the most part, uh, the type of stuff I get is mostly directed at either, uh, you know, all the, like the liberal side of it and, or people accusing me of what you were just saying a minute ago, the opposite of what you that I'm, you know, like faking it all or, or, or whatever, but it, it's not normally focused on the making fun of the South part. I've been doing that like since I started, but I mean, I'm doing it in a way of, I'm doing it from the perspective of somebody that is from there and grew up there. And I'm just talking about, you know, what I know or whatever so I've never felt like I was, you know, piling on or anything like that uh, in the same way that, you know, you when you see stereotypical, you know, redneck uh, humor or whatever in movies and stuff, it's just like lazy and low effort. And clearly somebody else's some Hollywood person's opinion of what the South is like. And it's not like and that stuff is obvious. And I think that mine is different because, like, I think they could tell that you know, I am one of them, like genuinely, I always felt like it almost worked in reverse for a long time. Like when I was starting out doing stand up, and, uh, nobody knew who I was yet. The crowds in the South, uh, which is where I mostly was doing shows that would let me get away with a lot more than they would. Like if I had been, you know, a New York comic or something like that, because I sounded like them and acted like them and everything. You got so, an but you got an affection for the South. I mean, even when you're dogging yeah. on, you know, you've got a real, it, that comes through totally. I mean, it's obvious you, you've got a love for the South and much of what is in the South. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Very much. Yeah. And I think, you know, that that does make a difference in terms of what you're talking about. People getting upset specifically at that aspect of it, at the making fun of the South part. I think people can tell that it comes from a place of love and all that. So they, you know. Yeah, it's not as much of a problem. Yeah, you can make fun of your own family, kind of deal, right? Yeah, no one else right. can, but I can, kind of deal, right? Um, yeah, exactly. One of my, you know, you've, I've sort of assembled a list of my some of my favorite videos of yours. Uh, one of them is the "Make America White Again" video from June of 2016. What's up, y'all? Trey Crowder back on the porch. A lot of people have asked me what I think about what happened here in East Tennessee last week. In case you missed it, a crazy old white asshole, or as the GOP calls it the base decided he was going to erect a bunch of campaign billboards with the slogan make america white again this motherfucker here y'all see shit like this is why other people hear my accent and think that i'm about to rip my shoes off and start throwing raccoons through trailer windows fuck this guy make america white again when was america white when white people first came to this country, they had to kill most of the red people just to make room for the black people they were planning on subjugating. This country ain't never been all white. But he means culturally, and that's what he said. He said America would be better off if it went back to the Ozzie and Harriet, leave it to beaver type of life. Oh, really? You mean before the dunk was invented and people thought banana jello was a hit and dessert? No, thank you. American culture has improved dramatically since other races earned the right to make their presence known. I don't want to live in a country without trap music. Fuck you. I'm trying to get turned. And I don't think women are going to start shaking their asses to Kenny G, so to hell with making America white again. And to hell with this guy. And that's been the only good part about this to me, is that as far as I can tell, most people seem to be disregarding this dude like the dipshit pissant that he is. Which I appreciate, because no, 
this guy does not represent where I grew up. But that doesn't mean he don't represent something. Because, see, he was explicitly and admittedly inspired by Donald Trump. And his logic ain't hard to follow. He thought, well, Trump spoke his mind about Mexicans and Muslims and people loved it. Maybe if I speak my mind about making America white, people will love me too. Luckily, he's a Republican, and like many Republicans, he was wrong about literally everything he thought, so that didn't happen. But it's still a bad sign. That crazy asshole and his crazy asshole opinions would exist with or without Donald Trump, but those signs he put up probably wouldn't, and that's plenty bad enough. To a lot of Trump supporters, making America great again and making America white again are the exact same thing. Let's all try to keep that in mind between now and November. Two chains! And you're going after the white supremacist really hard. Uh, and th that element of the South can be ignored, and you do not ignore it. Um, that ever gets right. sticky for you? Do you mean, do I ever have, like, encounters with those people uh, and do any, you ever like, get the you know the the death threat that kind of thing you know? i mean i have like that has happened but not that often to be honest with you and even when it has happened it's been in the form of a you know me message on facebook or, or something like that some you know keyboard I mean? warrior out there who's, right yeah. every, every time it's never been a uh, face-to-face no one's ever sent me anything in the mail or, you know, that type of thing. I mean, you know, thankfully, don't get me wrong. Yeah. I'm not, I don't want to have to deal with all that. But so far, I haven't had to, luckily. Talk about the, the neo-Nazi as this group of just perennial losers that have been on the, the losing side of history time and time again. Now, we're, we're seeing an empowering of the, the white supremacist and the Trump, you know, in Trumpistan. But... Um, you know, do you want to talk about that? I mean, you've got a pretty strong take on, you know, these people are, are they're just, I wish I had your timing. I wish I had your language to do it. But you, the, we're talking about they have been on the wrong side, the losing end, the short end of the stick right. every freaking time, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, historically, they're, yes, they're always on the wrong side of history. It's the same people over and over again. Uh, but one, like, so, like, the people at, like, Charlottesville, who are, you know, there's neo-Nazis at Charlottesville, and they're also flying Confederate flags and everything. So they got swastikas and Confederate flags. I feel a lot of different things about that at the same time, and they're all negative, uh, obviously. But, like, for, you know, for one, they're, you know, out there, like, proudly flying the, uh, you know, regalia and symbols and icons and stuff of two you know regimes who famously got destroyed you know who got their asses beat by the good guys <laughs> because they were fighting on the side of evil and lost and i just don't know what makes a person rally behind that i guess it's because yeah they're just they're also losers or feel like that they were you know downtrodden downtrodden and you know, we're like underdogs or something, I guess. But I just, it's so weird to me. But the other thing that's weirder personally to me about it is that like growing up in the deep South, I've seen obviously Confederate flags a lot for a long time, less now than when I was a kid, which is good, obviously, but they are still there. But, and most of the guys that I knew and saw like when I was growing up who would fly the Confederate flag, like they were not down with Nazis. You know what I mean? Like I knew plenty of racist papaws who, you know, loved the stars and bars, but had, you know, fought the Nazis in the war or whatever. Like they just, I don't know when that exactly happened. I mean, I get, you can see the, uh, you know, the philosophies of the two making good bedfellows, but it still is a weird combination to me because that was never a, a thing before. Like when I was growing up there, the, conf the hardcore, you know, rebel flag fellers were not at all also down with the Nazis, you know, and it's just everything about it is just so weird. And I hope that what that all is about ultimately the reason that they're so outlandish and everything right now and in your face is because 
I'm hopeful that they are like ultimately on a long timeline, they're in their death throes right now. Like I think it's actually gotten better and better for the rest of us that they've been consistently losing. Oh, you know, on just gradually and continuously year after year. And they reached a point where, you know, they were at the, the brink the brink of to- brink of total collapse, and this is like their last gasp, you know, effort at not dying off is mm-hmm. what I think and hope. So, you know, we'll see. Charlottesville, Virginia, ugly business, man, and all over some participation trophies for our crimes against humanity. I tell you what, I'm glad Del Earnhardt ain't here to see this shit. Look, with my background, I'm not surprised by all this, but it makes me sad. One of the saddest parts to me is I know these guys; they think they're patriots. You know, fighting for the real America with their swastikas and their Confederate flags. Man, I don't know that there's any symbol that's more inherently un-American than the Confederate flag. It's sort of the point of the fucking thing. But there they are in full regalia, exercising their rights as Americans. We got a right to assemble here. We got a right to protest for that statue. Fly that flag, buddy. Yes, you do. But... Screaming about your rights as an American while rocking the Confederate flag is like arguing against gay marriage with a dick in your mouth, you dumb fuck. It makes no sense. But that's the thing with these assholes. They're immune to irony. 100% natural immunity to it. Don't affect them at all. Stand out there hollering about supremacy while cosplaying as two separate regimes famous for getting the shit beat out of them. Supremacy, my ass. Because that's the thing. Ultimately, at their core, these people are losers. Losers who fetishize other losers. I know you can look at the coverage and the pictures and the fucking White House and feel like they're not losing right now, but in the grand scheme, they absolutely are. A few decades ago, they had Jim Crow and George Wallace. This weekend, they could barely find 500 dipshits that could afford a fucking bus ticket. They've been losing battle after battle, fight after fight for over 200 years in this country, and these are their death throes. We just have to stay the course. And on that note, my fellow rural Americans out there, I've known too many of y'all over the years, good people, that see some shit like this and turn a blind eye, or bite your tongue, because you don't want to fuck up the potluck, and I get that. But them days are over, y'all. Your silence is your complicity. So whether it's on Facebook or face-to-face at a PTA meeting, you got to start letting these assholes know that they do not speak for all of us. Because Trump proved on Saturday, in this, refusing to pick a side is the same thing as picking their side. And trust me, historically, that ain't a side you want to be on, unless you like losing. I've got a call on the switchboard, area code 662. You are on the Thinking Atheist podcast with Trey Crowder. Who's this? Seth, it's Luke. We talked on Atheist Experience. How you doing, man? Luke, thanks for calling. What do you have for the show today? Oh, man, I just uh, wanted to pitch in here. Um, Trey's been hilarious person and uh i want to send him a doctor bill for the busted muscle in my abdomen <laughs> um that hurt <laughs> all right yeah but, well i appreciate uh, that man actually, uh, I, go ahead <laughs> i've got i've got something i want to talk about it's serious but uh you know about fetal heartbeat bills that are going around you know those that are they're trying to make uh, abortion illegal because of uh, a human being being fully formed when their heart is fully formed. Okay. And I was thinking, re- Republicans, they don't believe in life. If they believed in life, they would care about orphans and they would care about single mothers and all that. So I was thinking, what is this about? It's not about life. But these are mostly Christians, so it's got to be about the soul, right? And I was thinking, where is the soul? And what is that? And it occurred to me that the prefrontal cortex is probably the closest thing to a soul. Because that controls all your behavior, all your executive function. And that is not fully formed until you're 25. So we could start aborting people until they're 25. Well, I mean, if Wouldn't we're going cool? like, to talk about the church, they believe, I mean, they believe it's magic anyway. So at the moment of conception, that's when the soul is created, and that's why they're going. And many of them genuinely do believe they're protecting a life. 
they they see it as say i mean they they've ignored everything else they're they're more pro-birth i'll give you that right than they are pro-life right. i don't know uh, trey i don't know you've gone after alabama talking about yeah. the uh, pretty much back asswards bill and and thinking that's been going on down there you want to speak to any of that i mean i agree with the first you know part of the that whole thing about i mean to me because i've i've talked about it some before too the that whole pro-life people also being anti you know welfare and putting kids in cages you know immigrant kids in cages and 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 all of that type of thing i think is just you know baldly hypocritical and shameful uh, on their part and i did I, and i've always thought it does illustrate that they're clearly not pro-life uh, ultimately i don't know how they could continue to say that with a straight face except i do because i know how their brains work which is you know <laughs> irregularly but like to me i i don't know how you could do that try you know be both at the same time having said that uh we, like you said at the end there it, it'd be more accurate to say they're pro-birth but in terms of that part of their argument yeah i mean they that is what they believe. Like what you said, for the most part, life begins at conception. And so to them, that means an abortion is in k killing a baby. Uh, you know, I mean, they think that, and thus it's no wonder that they can be so, you know, fervent and hardcore about that particular um, argument. I mean, it's a hard one because you got to think if someone like – Louis C.K. has a bit about that. It's like just just actually like stop and think for a second that it's a person. This person genuinely believes completely that abortion is murdering a baby. He was like, you know, how would you expect him to act? Like, of course, they're going to be pretty upset about it all the time. It's just it sucks because obviously I don't agree with their assessment of it all. But. I mean, yeah, it's just those people are hard to get through, hard to get through to on basically everything. But I feel like abortion is like near the very top of the list for that reason. Yeah. You know, it's hard. <clears throat> Thank you, Luke. I appreciate the call very much. Thanks, Seth. All right. Take it. Talk to you later. All right. Has it been harder for comedians these days? Um, you know, some subjects are off limits. Is there starting to be some pushback against that? What's your take on the culture? Uh, you mean like PC culture? PC like culture, all Dave Chappelle, whatever you want to call right it. Now. Yeah, I mean, are there things yeah. that are off limits for comedians? And isn't it the job of the comedian to to find the edge of the envelope and push pretty hard? And I don't know that I know the answer. Yeah. I just, you know, I'm talking to a comedian. Right. And you tell me. Well, you know liberal redneck i consider myself a very liberal you know progressive person and everything but really all of that is is from the left like that's all being you know coming from the left for the most part the whole uh pc culture thing and you're not allowed to joke about this you're not allowed to joke about that um and so it's like i personally have always subscribed to the uh you know the South Park Doctrine, uh, they kind of covered this in one of their episodes, you know, 15 years ago, probably at this point, where that basically they just said it's like either all of it is OK or none of it is like essentially. I don't know how you draw the line between what is and is not OK to joke about. So to me, the rule is because every single person is going to have a different line that they draw no matter what. Cause that's just how people work. Cause I've, I've experienced it myself where like, I, I'd say all this crazy stuff in my videos about a, any number of different types of people, Christians or rednecks or like uh, Republicans, but also Californians or, you know, vegans, whatever. But then I say, you know, one thing about like Bernie Sanders specifically and a good chunk of people on my Facebook page flip out because Bernie is unassailable for some reason. Like you can't make even jokes about, it. you can't even call him, you know, say that he looks like a soup eating mother, you know, which he does. <laughs> he, he, he does look at him. Like, tell me that guy don't eat the hell out of soup all the time. And that's all I say. Anyway, whatever. 
people got very upset about that because everyone has something, some line that they can draw, everybody, and everybody's is different. So I don't know how, as a society, we can draw one line and say that's the line, and beyond that, you can't joke about anything, but everything on the other side of it is okay. I just think that's fundamentally impossible to do. So to me, the rule is and has always been it just it better be funny like you have to make it funny if it's genuinely funny and you know people understand like the spirit of where it's coming from or whatnot i still think even in 2019 in the era of outrage culture and cancel culture and all that i still think that you could joke about pretty much whatever you want to if you're you know deft and savvy about it um I, so I don't think we've gotten to a point yet where you're just straight up not allowed, you know, uh, so far. We talk about the well-read comedy tour. You referenced it earlier, but what is it and where is it? The well-read comedy tour is, yeah, me and these other two guys who are like good friends of mine. Uh, I've known for years, but they're also from tiny little towns in the deep south and, you know, pinko commie leftist godless heathen liberals uh so that's what made us buddies in the first place uh before all the videos before all that we've been friends for a long time and uh we tour together and it's a sta uh, the show itself is you know pretty basic in terms of format stand-up show which is Corey goes up for a little while drew goes up in the middle i grow up and go up at the end um as far as where it's at we've been i think I think it it's 46 or 47 states now we've been to, and I don't even know how many cities. I mean, we've been all over the country. It's all over, and we have a website. It's wellreadcomedy.com, and it's uh, wellredcomedy.com, and it has ticket information about everywhere we're going to be uh, going this fall and beyond. But, yeah, we're all over the place. So, yeah, I'd love to be dumb, but I'm not. And I'll tell you what else. I don't think we're getting dumber as a society either. That's become popular to say. People are like idiocracy. Movies coming true. Only stupid people are breeding. No, 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 honey, no. I mean, do you think we're dumber than people used to? Do you know how dumb people used to be? A lot. They were a lot fucking dumb. Let me tell you. I know people like two hundred years ago or whatever believed that women who liked to dance could fly brooms and turn babies into frogs and shit. Like we're. We are smarter than them, by a lot. But I get why people think that. I get why that attitude persists, because this is a real weird time we're living in, if you think about it. This is the first time in all of human history in which stupid people have had a voice. That's never been true, ever, <laughs> ever. It's true. I mean, think, think about it, man. A hundred years ago, stupid people couldn't even read. Now they can tweet. <laughs> yeah. And, and they love to tweet, buddy. Take it from me. But what I don't understand is why the rest of us give a shit what they tweet about. And we do. Turn on CNN, man, within five minutes. They'll put up a graphic or a ticker or something. Tweets from our viewers. Tweets from the viewers. Why? why? Oh, yeah. Queefer Sutherland 69. Let's get his thoughts on ISIS. <laughs> Why? Area code 440, you're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. You're on with Trey Crowder. Who's this? Hey, this is Lauren. How you doing? Very well. What's on your mind? Terrific. Trey, we saw you out at Hilarities last year. Thanks for coming by. You guys were great. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. Hey, uh, come back any old time, please. I have, I'd like to throw something out here, maybe not so much a question, but a point of information for discussion. Uh, there's a trope that has gone around as it comes to the whole business of being politically correct and whatever else have you to the effect of no one has the right not to be offended. Now, I mean, obviously this is potentially a loaded phrase, and it's something that uh, I think absolutely, uh, I think should be a part of this discussion. My question to both of you, Trey and uh, Seth, both, uh, especially as it comes to comedy, 
I mean, yeah, you have to be funny, but at the same time, too, uh, do we really need to be tiptoeing around the people who are such ouch tubes that they can't deal with, you know, something that may not be politically correct? Trey, you want to no, go first I mean, or what? No, I mean, you know, short answer, no, I don't think you should have to do that um, as a comedian. Uh, I, that thing you said, you know, no one has the right to not be offended. I'm a you know, big believer in that. People get offended. It's like, okay, well, all right, you got offended. So what? Like, what does that matter <laughs> to the to the rest yeah. of us? Like, everybody gets offended by, you know, some things sometimes. Yeah. Uh I, the only the only thing with that is I there are people who like to use this exact argument as a reason to just like say a bunch of you know like vile mean shit stuff right yeah exactly and then they use this argument uh, for that that doesn't mean that it's not still a sound argument though but I just want to put that caveat out there because that does that type of thing happens mm -hmm. a lot, but no, I don't think, you know, if what you're saying is worth yeah. saying and you got a good, you know, way of saying it, you shouldn't have to try to, you know, tiptoe around everybody who might not appreciate it. I think yeah, if, no kidding. if you, uh, if you don't like it, you know, walk out, you know, you get it, change refund, the channel, refund the ticket kind of thing. Now, you know, we have to be careful because mm -hmm. there are a lot of people in this world who have been gen genuinely marginalized and attacked right. and have lived. I mean, you know, Trey does a lot of work for talking about the challenges that the LGBTQ community go through and talk about a sensitive nerve. I mean, these people have in so many instances been on the short end of the stick. They have really been mm -hmm. oppressed and marginalized by the, the culture and they're fighting for legitimacy every single day. So if I see somebody who's being unnecessarily cruel from the stage to the LGBTQ community, I can say, well, that's offensive. Like I, I subjectively say that's, that is offensive to me, uh, but I still believe they have the right to say it. And then I have the right to I say almost that. Wonder I, go ahead. I almost wonder if they, we need to come up with a different word for it. I mean, uh, I mean, hell, how many of us are offended by, you know, all the BS that gets thrown at us from, you know, from the Christian right and all this other stuff. And yet they're the ones who are constantly saying, oh, we're oppressed. Oh, we're, we're being whatever have you. I also wanted to throw out, have you, th th this goes back a couple of years, but have you seen uh, Stephen Fry's response to the whole issue of being offended. I think it's actually on YouTube and it's classic because it ends with the lovely phrase, what's well, so freaking what? Yeah. Actually, no, said, so fucking what? Yeah, it was, I was <laughs> exactly. going to say, it, it was actually a, and a, a very direct, and you know, talk about someone who's on the, the global stage. Stephen Fry is no stranger to controversy or speaking his mind. Uh, I think it, it's important to try to gauge intent. If someone's out there with ill intent and malice, you know, Trey mentioned the word vile yeah. or being vile to someone. Uh, look, if someone's out there genuinely doing that, then, you know, we can reject it and say, I don't, I, I don't want any part of that, but they still have a right to say it. And we have a right to support it or not support it. And um, at exactly. the end of the day, you know, I, I do think we need to toughen up just a little bit in a lot of ways because, Offense culture has made it so that anybody anywhere has got people second guessing themselves. Mm -hmm. And I, the role of comedy mm -hmm. is to try to get us to not take ourselves so seriously. And, you know, a lot of the comedy, it's, it's like uh, the liberal redneck. A lot of the comedy that you do is directed at your own demographic, Trey, right? I mean, if you're going to dish yeah. it out, you're willing to take it as well, right? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And, but one thing I was just thinking about with, you know, outrage culture and all that, one thing that I think is happening a lot of the time with that sort of thing is that there really isn't any actual, like, true backlash to whatever a thing is, that the backlash itself has kind of been, like, fabricated wholesale uh, by people, you know, wanting to write clickbait articles or, or what have you. Like, for example... Like, I don't know if you say anything about it or kept up with it at all, but it's been a huge thing in the comedy community recently because Dave Chappelle put out a new special and it's had tons of articles written about it. He's gotten hotly criticized by a lot of, you know, uh, journalists and critics or whatever people who write articles uh, primarily mm -hmm. 
for um, the content of some of it, which is like he himself says throughout the whole thing, like he knows he's pushing buttons and pushing boundaries. He's going to piss people off and all that. And I mean, yeah, uh, some of the stuff is in there. I, you know, I didn't think was that great or that he necessarily should have said, but he's still, you know, Dave Chappelle. But my point is all these articles and stuff and this big like discussion happening online about it. Um, But on Rotten Tomatoes, it has a critics score of like 12 percent. And then with like with like 33 with like 33 reviews submitted and it has an audience score of 99% with like 600 or something hmm. like like hundreds of reviews for it um so like i just feel like that's a even i just feel like most people it seems to me that watched his special cuz there's also some absolutely like vintage Dave Chappelle brilliant stuff on it that's just unassailable i think most people who watched it even if there were parts throughout it that they weren't really into, like I kind of wish he hadn't gone there or said that still weren't like outraged about it or want to boycott Dave Chappelle and ultimately, you know, enjoyed the thing overall. And we're just reasonable about it is what I'm saying instead of, you know, getting infuriated like the blogosphere mm-hmm. did. And I think that kind of thing actually happens, uh, you know, a fair amount. So Appreciate your call, my friend. Was there anything else? Well, just, I mean, I wanted to reinforce the one point that I think you brought, Seth, is just growing a little bit thicker skin. I mean, I, mean, I know it's easy for me to say as a relatively privileged dude. I'm just, I think if you're, if you're yeah. always going to allow the stones that are in the, you know, in the path to trip you up, you will never get anywhere. So I think, I just think maybe a better way to say it is we need to do a better job of choosing our battles and choosing who we allow to derail us in our own journey, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I, you know, he, I don't, you know, Trey, you can answer this for me. If you've got an idea, are there any gay comedians out there uh, taking left-handed shots at the uh, LGBT community? Because let's be honest, it's a target. And I'll um, say right now, I'm a member. Well, I mean, I, I would, not to jump Trey on of, Trey here, but I mean, I'm guessing anybody from any demographic is, they're probably used to making fun of themselves to a degree as part of their act. Right. That's what I was going to say. There's mm-hmm. definitely plenty of comics who absolutely joke about the gay community or being gay or whatever, because, you know, that yeah, that's their experience. Um, and, but not in a not in a way that would upset the rest of the gay community, in my opinion. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, well, that's know. the magic word, isn't it? Are, I don't know of any who are like, you know, making their bones by going after the gay community mm-hmm. or anything like that while also being gay right. themselves. Um, so, yeah. My friend, I got to move on. I appreciate your call very much. <clears throat> Absolutely. Take good care, both of you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, you know, probably the best comedians speak to their own, ex- well, with a few exceptions, speak to their own experiences. They're storytellers. I mean, you got the Stephen right. Wrights who were doing the the abstract one line, and it's brilliant. But I think most of the best comedians aren't they storytellers? Yeah, and and it's normally coming from you know their experience and their life and about their own you know, community, you know what I mean? Like, like Chris, Chris Rock is my personal favorite uh, comedian of all time. Cause he's the comedian that got me into uh, stand up, like in the first place, really uh, when bigger and blacker came out at HBO special uh, when I was like 12 years old. But, you know, Chris Rock has, has famously <clears throat> like told, had a lot of bits, made a lot of jokes about, the black community in America and the state of it and everything. And, uh, you know, a lot of like critical jokes as well, but, you know, always from a place of, you know, he's talking to his people about their issues, you know, internally and how he, his, you know, how he sees it all. It was never like, him uh, being malicious or aligning himself with the other side or anything like that. Cause it's like, this is, you know, this is how this is his experience and how he feels about it. And he's 
one of the greats. I feel like most of them, most of the greats, you know, are like that. Bill Burr right now is one of the greatest comedians out there, and he very much has a perspective of a, you know, middle aged white dude from Boston. Uh, but, <laughs> but in the but in the best way, do you know what I mean? Like he's mad about things, and he's like calling out the you know bullshit of society at every level and, and everything. But he's not um, he's not punching down or anything like that. He's not abusing his power as a, you know, top shelf comedian yeah. to do any of that stuff. Talking but about it's the, all still coming from his perspective. The great. I saw a clip where you get a shout out from freaking Morgan Freeman. <clears throat> Tell me yeah. this story. What happened? Well, uh, from my perspective, I mean, I had never, I actually still have never in person met Morgan Freeman. Um, I've had, I've met, uh, like, you know, some of his people, I've had like correspondence with him and whatever else, but I still haven't met him in person. But at the time that that happened, I, of course I love Morgan Freeman, you know, who, who doesn't, but I'd never, I'd never heard anything about him being a fan of mine or anything like that it was completely, totally out of left field. Like, I didn't know anything about it. Food? Your go-to comfort food. <sighs> Pasta Molinae. Mm -hmm. Who makes you laugh the most? Who? We can circle back. We've left it. Mike oh, left it. I know who. Trey Crowder. Oh, yeah. Phenomenal. <laughs> Huh? It's so funny. No, no, it's hysterical. So, Man, we're so on the money. I got big bank cases on a motherfucker. Ain't shit tight, cause I'm still getting steel. There are pe a lot of people in my uh, hometown or like my wife's hometown who I think had this element, and this is kind of a, I don't know, if, try to tell like the short version of this. There's very much a thing in these small towns, but it's mine and, and hers, which are basically the same type of place culturally, even though they're five hours apart, of, like, the, the whole, like, comedy thing and the internet and all that that I was doing, like, it wasn't, it wasn't real, do you know, like, to a lot of people, like, it, they didn't, it was like I was living, like, a, a, a fantasy or something, like, it wasn't a real thing that I was doing, I guess. And then that Morgan Freeman thing happened and it kind of like legitimized me uh, to a lot of those types of people, you know, who before had thought I was just like, you know, playing around. I thought it was like at, a hobby, something you kind of yeah, did on weekends and not uh, right. And, but yeah, just that I, or, or that I was like deluding myself about it. You know what I mean? Like that it wasn't like a real thing that i was doing and then that happened and for a lot of people that that's when they realized like oh okay i guess this is you know oh, he's I actually mean, at least somewhat legit you making know? that so, my ringtone i mean i morgan freeman yeah. yeah i just say in my name i just roll it i just play it in the background while i'm making dinner just you know morgan freeman me morgan it freeman. was awesome that's that's really cool uh, you've been really generous with your time real fast one more uh phone call and then we'll uh, we'll call it area code 806 thanks for waiting on me you're on the thinking atheist podcast with trey crowder who's this hey how's it going this is john john thanks for calling what's on your mind uh i'm just listening in. i uh agree with a lot of what you're saying um i just feel like it is getting harder for comedians to be as funny as they used to be for the various reasons you've kind of already gone over. Cause, uh, I just don't know if I, I don't know how to put it really, but like how Dave Chappelle mentioned in that skit, um, there were certain words that he couldn't say on network TV that I'm not going to repeat here, obviously, but he could say the N word openly. And, uh, he asked him why he could say that. And he said, well, because you're black and therefore you can say that word. But, then he goes on to say, well, yeah, I know I'm not gay, but I understand why I don't want to use these slurs, but I'm also not an N-word. So that kind of, 
don't know if you've seen the special or not, but that joke was kind of a cool joke that resonated with me. I haven't seen the special. So it, I, it, I, I've seen the controversy around it. Um, his overall point was uh, what? Basically, he said, you allow me to use the N-word openly, even though it is kind of a negative word, but they won't allow me to use the uh, certain slurs for homosexual people, stuff like that. So his point was basically, why are you limiting certain words that I can say, yet I can also still say the N-word and stuff like that? It was kind of like a free speech point he was trying to make. Um, anyway, if you watch this special, you'll get it a little more, but I think he made some pretty good points about how free speech is applied differently depending on who's saying it, how it's used, obviously. But in co comedy, I think it can really end up hindering people if you're, uh, you know, walking on eggshells on what you want to say. I, I mean, to be fair, a lot of it is edgy comedy, but you know what I mean? Uh, uh, I don't know if you've, you've watched a lot of his work before, but I think he's a really great comedian, and I thought his last special was good. All right. Well, we'll, we'll I'll check it out. I appreciate um, the call. Well, that, that bit in particular he's talking about, basically this is what Chappelle said, is when he was on Chappelle's show, he couldn't, he had to deal with standards and practices a lot at the network. He had a sketch where they said, uh, you know, the F word, fag, right? They said fag. And they told him he couldn't say that he had to take it out. And he was like, well, but I say, we say the N word on my show all the time, like over, you know, repeatedly. And that's never been a problem. Why is this a problem? <laughs> and she said, well, Dave, well, you're not gay. And he said, yeah, well, I'm not a nit either. Right. And uh, that's, that's pretty much the gist of what he said. I, that bit, that particular bit for, for me while watching it was one that like, you know, I appreciated like where it was coming from or whatever, but I don't really think it holds up, honestly, for the most part. Uh, you know, who am I to question Dave Chappelle? That's not really what I'm trying to do. I'm, I'm just saying, like, in my opinion, that exact same logic applied in reverse would allow like a, you know, white man uh, who is gay or whatever, you know, to say the N word with impunity on a sketch show or whatever by the exact same logic just flipped around, which I don't think Chappelle would be on board with. In my, to me, and I, you know, I'm a straight white guy, so who cares? But like, I think that he should have been able to say both on his show, depending on what he was saying by saying them in the sketches. Like, the context of everything and the intent of it is what should be the determining factor. There shouldn't be a blanket rule that says that, that he, a black comic can't say uh, those words on his stand on his sketch show, but he can't say the N word because he's black. Or if you had a gay comic, he could say all the gay slurs, but he couldn't say the N word or whatever. I, I mean, I, I think that that is all, uh, you know stupid in a way it should the intent and context of it is what should be the determining factor um to me you know and again i really feel like at the end of the day the vast majority of actual people just you know citizens and not uh you know critics and bloggers and all of that i think that most people are still pretty good about making that determination when they watch something and understanding what the point that's ultimately being made is and, you know, not getting all up in arms about it. I think most people are still pretty good at that at the end of the day, despite all this uh, PC culture talk that's been going on lately. Didn't intend for you know, a good portion of the show to be so heavy. I thought it'd be more uh, like <laughs> everybody's going that direction. What, what makes uh, you laugh, dude? What cracks you up? Oh, well, I mean, you know, again, I really enjoyed that special of his. And there was some that he talks about Jesse Smollett in there or Smollett or whatever. And he talks about school shootings and stuff in a way that's just brilliant and hilarious. So, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, Chappelle's still got it. Uh, other things that make me laugh, I also love Bill Burr. Uh, Tom Segura is a great comedian. John Mulaney is one of my favorites. Outside of stand-up. Uh, I'm trying to think what like funny TV shows that I've been watching lately, but I'm drawing a blank. Or maybe right you now, just want to break. Maybe funny, you know, as a profession 
after a while, you just want to go somewhere and just be all like thoughtful. <laughs> yeah, no, that, no, that's, that's very much a thing. I do feel that way sometimes. And I know a lot of other people that work in the company, you know, either stand-ups or comedy writers or what have you also are that way. Like when they, you know, when they're trying to take, you know, break for their own personal entertainment comedy is the last thing they want to watch. They want to watch, you know, a thriller or true crime or whatever. Sometimes I feel that way, but I also still very much enjoy, you know, comedy products too. Uh, I, I just, I, I normally like, I mean, I like the stuff that is um, attempting to say something for the most part. You know, I've always been, that's always been my, personal taste like any kind of comedy that you can tell has like a point or a message that they're trying to get across instead of just like just being um funny uh, which sometimes i also love that but my favorite things have always been the things that are wrapped around some kind of like larger point that is trying to be made you know yeah. so anything in that ballpark is my stuff Trey Crowder, how do people find you if they are just now being introduced to you and your work? Best resources to find your work? Um, mentioned earlier, Well Read, R-E-D, wellreadcomedy.com for tickets and information and all that. As far as everything else, I mean, you can just uh, use my name, Trey, T-R-A-E Crowder on Twitter and Facebook, Instagram, all that. It's, uh, you know, just search for my name, YouTube, you'll find it. Uh, that way awesome trey you're a funny guy and you're real and i just love your stuff and i'm so glad you took a few to talk to us here today and we'll point some folks your direction and uh, all success to you okay thank you very much seth it's good to be on here again i much appreciate it buddy you bet